So now let's think about, I, I talked about what the Fed's bailout proposal is, is that they essentially want to take $700 billion and use that to buy some of these smelly assets, these CDOs that have on, that, that a lot of these banks have on their balance sheet, and that which, which have been kind of the cause of why a lot of these banks are going under, or at least why a lot of the banks aren't lending to each other. And we said, you know, I, I kind of touched on the last video that, you know, that's, in my mind, maybe it solves a problem, but if it does, even if it does solve a problem, and we'll address that in this issue, but in this in this video, but it, it seems like a really horrible thing to do because if you were to buy these assets that are worth, let's say they're worth zero, you pay $2 billion for them, you're essentially writing a check to the equity holders of this company, the shareholder of this company who bought, you know, they, they benefited from all the reward and of, of the last five years of getting the returns on that stock price and the dividends and whatever else. And now all of a sudden when things go bad, they don't bear the risk. The American taxpayer bears the risk. And so you're writing a $1 billion check to the equity holder and a $1 billion check to the liability holders or the people who lent this company money. And you've probably heard the word moral hazard bantered around. Moral hazard. And this is as good of a time as any to explain what people mean by a moral hazard. Well, there's a couple. There's one just the superficial notion of, hey, you are writing a check to the very same people who made bad decisions, right? The people who lent this company money made bad decisions, and the equity holders of this company made bad decisions. One, the people who invested in this company, they didn't, they didn't realize the risk. And also, a lot of the equity holders are the management of the company. And they're the very ones who invested in these CDOs. And if you were to essentially buy out these CDOs, you're not penalizing them for making bad decisions. They get to keep all their bonuses before. Maybe they get to keep their job still. And you're propping up their stock price. So that's one element of moral hazard. The other element of moral, moral hazard, and this kind of a, this is a more nuanced notion, but it's in some ways the more important element of moral hazard. And that's if the government goes in every time that there's some type of financial stress, right? All of these people took risk. They, had, they, they got the reward already, but when the risk starts to hit, the government goes in and makes sure that these people don't have to, don't have to deal with their consequences. The moral hazard there is, is in the future, people are going to say, you know what? I'm going to take risk. Because if when times are good, I'm going to make the money. And when times are bad, we've seen it multiple times, the government, the US government, is all too ready to come out and bail, the, bail out the private sector. So you, you create this moral hazard where even in the, you, you're making these bubbles more likely to happen in the future because people are not going to be as concerned as, about risk because they're like, look at these idiots. They took all the risks in the world. They bought CDOs, that people lent money to these people who bought CDOs, they were levered up, and the government even bailed out these dudes. So I can take huge risk, I'll get all the reward from them, and in the future, the government's just going to bail me out. And that's the other element of moral hazard. Well, anyway, with that aside, and I would argue that there's a lot of moral hazard with the government's current bailout proposal, maybe that moral hazard is worth it if it prevents this chain, this cascade of events from happening, if somehow it allows people to start lending to each other and most importantly start lending to the real world, like the guy who wants to build a factory or the farmer who wants to um, borrow money for seeds for next year's crop. Now what I've heard, and I don't know the exact numbers here, and I'm not an expert here, is that there's about, uh, I've heard the number bent around $5 trillion of these toxic CDOs. So one, the, uh, on, on all of these financial institutions' bank balance sheets. So I don't know if that's the accurate number, but what I do know for sure is $700 billion is, is, a, is a relatively small fraction of the total amount that's out there. And Bernanke and Paulson, they're essentially arguing, no, no, no I, we, you know, we know $700 billion, it doesn't represent all of the CDOs out there, even if you were to buy them at a discount. But what we're hoping to do is by going out there and with a large amount of money, uh, and, and starting to buy these CDOs, that it'll hopefully create some type of a market in these CDOs. And they talk about doing a reverse auction where we'll say, okay, we're ready to buy 100 billion in CDOs. So whatever banks, whatever banks are willing to give us 100, the 100 billion dollars worth of CDOs at the best price, those are the ones we're going to buy from. That's a reverse auction. You go and you say, I want to buy. Who's going to sell to me for the cheapest price? And so that's what they said. And by doing that, maybe it'll create other 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 private interests. Will say, hey, the government's getting a good deal on these CDOs. I want to buy in too. And maybe other people will start buying the CDOs. The reason why I call that crap is because if other people were there to buy CDOs, they would buy them already. And when and and the bottom line is when you do this type of reverse auction, when you say, oh, I have a hundred billion, I want to spend on CDOs. 
Paulson and Bernanke, they're arguing that that would somehow create some type of market price for these CDOs that these, that the, these banks could then mark their assets and everyone will know what they're worth. Two problems. That will not be a market price because you're creating artificial demand. Artificial demand from the government. If the government wasn't there, there wouldn't be this $100 billion uh, entity wanting to buy assets, so the assets would go for less. And then the second thing is, what if the government uh, does that and people realize that these $2 billion of CDOs, even when the government does this reverse auction, are actually worth only, um, I don't know, these are only worth $500 million, right? That's what people are willing to unload them for. And, and it will probably be the more solvent people who do it, because for them it won't make them go bankrupt. Well, if they're really worth $500 million, then every other bank that holds the same things will have to write these this $200 million down to $500 million, this $2 billion down to $500 million, and so their equity will get wiped out, and the cascade will start all over again. So I don't buy it on two counts. One, I don't think it'll actually create a real market price that anyone would believe. I don't think it's going to make anyone jump into the market all of a sudden. Frankly, if someone thought these were good deals, there are a lot of very, very sophisticated investors out there who have a lot more knowledge about what these assets really mean than, frankly, the Treasury does. And if they thought they were good deals, I guarantee you there is capital out there where they would go in and buy these assets for what they thought is a good deal and hold them to maturity. There is cash out there, and I think that's a, a, an important issue that people don't realize. A lot of people are out there holding cash, they're holding treasuries. They just don't want to invest in these because they are bad deals. People are looking for a good deal, but these are most probably not worth much. They're probably worth nothing. So. What is another solution? And this is something that a lot of people have, have bantered around a lot. They said, well, why doesn't the government just go in, instead of just buying out these CDOs, which is essentially just writing a check to the very, few, the very people who got us into the situation, why not buy stock in these companies? So we, we talked about those situations with the, um, the sovereign wealth funds, right? Where the sovereign wealth fund comes in, bought, you know, in that example, they bought $3 billion worth of, of equity, and they gave $3 billion worth of cash, and then the company can use those to pay off its debt. That, frankly, is not a horrible idea. The only reason why I would say it's still not a great idea is you're diluting the shareholders. But what if this equity is worth zero, right? What if there's actually negative equity here? If this is worth zero, if these $2 billion are actually worth zero, then this is an insolvent company, right? You have $3 billion of assets, $4 billion of liabilities. This is actually minus $1 billion of equity. So really, the stock has no value. The correct share price of the stock, if, if we didn't have um, limited liability with corporations, would be uh, the correct market capitalization would be minus $1 billion. So why would you pay a positive price for, that, for those shares? So even in that situation, if this is really worth zero and the government were to buy shares, or buy a lot of shares and infuse this with capital, it would save the company. It would penalize the equity holders, because all of a sudden, instead of having 500 million shares, you'd maybe have 2 billion shares. If you owned 100% of the company before, now you only own 20% of the company. And that's actually what happened with AIG. You might say, well, that's a pretty good situation. But still, the government's taking a little bit of a hit. And, and frankly, if the government did that, I think the risk reward might be reasonable there. Because if the government were to infuse capital into these banks, if they were to, so let's say, let me do the example. Let's say there's 500 million shares now. The government says, you know what, we're going to give this company $4 billion. So we're going to give it four billion of cash. Four billion of cash, and let's say for those four billion shares, let's see if the current is for those four billion shares, we want, I don't know, we want another, I don't know, let's make it like really intense. Let's say the government wants 10, 10 billion shares, right? So essentially they're paying 40 cents per share. So then we're going to have 10 billion shares here. So that's 10,000 million. And we're going to have 10.5 billion shares. This is actually not a bad situation for me. So the company now will have $4 billion of cash, $4 billion of cash, $3 billion of other assets, and now the CDOs, and maybe those CDOs are worth nothing. Now, no matter what, this company cannot go bankrupt because it's $4 billion of cash, $4 billion of liability. It could pay off its liability with that equity infusion. And, that, and, 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 and the people who deserved to kind of take some downside did get downside. Because the equity holders, they used to have 100% of the company with their 500 million shares. Now they own, what is this? This is one, they own 121st of their company. So they, went, they got diluted from owning 100% of the company to owning what? Like, yeah, like less than 5% of the company. So this might be a fair situation. Although I would still say 
even in this situation, you are bailing out the people who lent this money to the bank, right? They they lent money to an institution that they should have known better than to lend money to. They said they, they're holding all these toxic assets. They collected interest on this institution, and right when the institution was about to go belly up, the government does this huge equity infusion and essentially takes over the company, makes it a part of the government, right? Because the government now owns 90-something percent of the company and pays off the liability holders. So I would still say that there is still some moral hazard here because in the future people say, "Oh, I'm willing to lend, maybe you know, you're you're you you're still hurting the equity holders, but you'd still be willing to lend to an American bank because you'd say when things get bad, the American government goes in and bails out the bank by buying a bunch of equity. So you won't properly price in risk in the future." But if 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 this does open up lending markets and people start lending to the farmer or to the guy who wants to build factories, then maybe this is worth it. And I'll actually, you know, in my mind, if, if the government is really not worried about the banks and they really are worried about this piece, right, the farmer who needs a loan or the guy who wants to build a factory that needs a loan, why don't they take that $700 billion and just create a fund to lend directly to the real world, to lend directly to Main Street? Why don't they just let all of these banks go bankrupt, go into bankruptcy? They'll come back, and they'll come back leaner and more efficient with proper risk measures, and the proper everyone will get punished appropriately so that in the next up cycle, there won't be all of this moral hazard. And you have the $700 billion that is going directly to lend to farmers and 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 companies that are building uh, capital equipment and whatever. And of course, there still is moral hazard, and it's going to get highly politicized. Who do you lend to, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe then you still do a reverse auction, but the bottom line is if the government were genuine about being concerned about Main Street, they wouldn't do they wouldn't use the seven hundred billion in this indirect way. They would lend it directly to Main Street. Anyway, see you in the next video.